sent me a text Wednesday and said, hey, how do you feel about doing the opening Sunday? I said, okay. And then I struggled the rest of the week <laughs> to, to have an idea of what to say and what to do. Amen. However, God is faithful. Amen. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to pray briefly and then, and then launch out and uh, try to bring you all along with me. And uh, we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for calling us to this place to fellowship with one another and with you and the Holy Spirit. And we invite you to be at the head of all that we say and all that we do this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now we're going to have a little bit of audience participation on the very front end. Just uh, maybe two or three of you. A single word that you think of as being key to success in God. Just a single word. Obedience. Okay, obedience, good. Worship, Worship good. Humility. Humility, all very good words. <laughs> but not the one I was thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do something a little bit different here. I'm going to share from a devotional that most people have heard of, maybe not read. It's My Utmost for His, High for His Highest by Oswald Cham Chambers. And it's entitled Getting There. Okay. Where the sin and the sorrow cease and the song and the saint commence. Do I want to get there? I can now. The questions that matter in life are remarkably few, and they are all answered by the words, come unto me. Come was the word that I was had in my mind and in my heart, okay? Not do this or don't do that, but come unto me. If I will come to Jesus, my actual life, will be brought into accordance with my real desires, I will actually cease from sin and actually find the song of the Lord begin. Have you ever come to Jesus? Watch the stubbornness of your heart. You will do anything rather than the one simple childlike thing. Come unto me. If you want the actual experience of ceasing from sin, you must come to Jesus. Jesus Christ makes himself the touchstone. Watch how he used the word come. At the most unexpected moments, there is the whisper of the Lord, come unto me. And you are drawn immediately. Personal contact with Jesus alters everything. Be stupid enough to come and commit yourself to what he says. The attitude of coming is that the will resolutely lets go of everything and deliberately commits all to him. And I will give you rest. I will stay you. Not I will put you to bed and hold your hand and sing you to sleep, but I will get you out of bed out of the languor and exhaustion, out of the state of being half dead while you are alive, I will imbue you with the spirit of life and you will be stayed by the perfection of vital activity. We get pathetic and talk about suffering the will of the Lord. Where is the majestic vitality and might of the Son of God about that? So as I was reading this a couple times through, there was a, a word he used. It's a common word, but it was used differently in his day when he wrote it. When he said that the Lord would stay us. So I looked up the word stay. It says to not move away from or leave a place or situation. If we come to Jesus, he will stay us there and we have and receive all that we need 
and ultimately the, that we desire. A couple scripture verses that I wanted to, to bring out. You know, I'm, I, I have a hobby horse. I like the fact that when God says something once, it's important. If he says it more than once, it's very important. Okay, so we're going to look at Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. And as I start to read it, you'll, you'll know why and where, we're, where we are. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the invitation, come and I will give you rest. That's where he stays us. He stays us in the rest where we cease from our own labors and our own efforts and move with him, move with the indwelling Holy Spirit who takes us where and when and how we ought to be. And the, the word lowly in here, you know, when he was talking about himself, lowly is being humble in manner or spirit, free from self-asserting pride. So when we take on the humbleness of Jesus, we're not being wiped out and done away with, but we're being put in our proper position, our proper posture. And we can rest in that. We don't have to pump it up or pump ourselves up or lift ourselves up because we're not capable. We rest. And over in, let's see. Oh, my other note card. Isaiah 55, one through three. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which, is, which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So one way of looking at this in my mind this morning was the key to everlasting life is to come to Jesus. Come to him and stay. And everything else flows from there. Everything else flows from there. So Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your call to come to you to lay aside our thoughts, our efforts, our struggles, and everything else that falls short. You bid us come, buy, eat, drink, and hear what you have for us. Lord, we give you thanks for that. We give you thanks. We rejoice that we have one such as you that not only calls us to come, but has the power and the heart and the desire to make it true what you've promised. And we thank you for that, Lord. We ask your help to walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother Cornelius, could you get the offering basket for us before you're seated? Good morning, good morning, good morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I too, when um, Sam texted me Wednesday, I was just like, okay, uh, Lord, well, 
saying you put it on Sam's heart to ask. So I guess you will give me what to say, because right now I need you to quiet all of this up in my head. Um, and we thank God that he does that. Um, and so just even, you know, just really thinking, um, Lord, you know, give me what you would have me to say on this day. And so um, he brought back to my memory, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you know, there was Pentecost Sunday. Um, and so, you know, just in reading of it, I just, you know, recall the story of Stephen. But for some reason, you know, and just reading about Stephen, I say, let me just go back to the beginning of Acts. And so, um, you know, God has a way of leading you to a scripture. You think you're going to read it for one reason and he'll be like, I'm going to show you something else. So just as I was reading it, I just started remembering and just hearing how the increase came with Pentecost. Um, like before Jesus came, he just had his 12 disciples. Then when the Holy Spirit came in Pentecost, there was 120 in the room when the Holy Spirit came down. And then even after that, Peter preached his first sermon and 3000 were added to the number. And then if you keep reading on a little bit further, you know, um, he healed the blind, he healed the lame man. And then it just talks about how even more um, that it increased like up to 5,000 were added. And if you just see, and if we know the God that we serve, he is the living God. So there's always going to be a growth. Um, and then even as he blessed us in Genesis, he said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So there's a, always an increase, a multiplication. And so, you know, just reading that, something stood out to me that when the 3000 were added, they were also baptized. And somebody made a point to say that for 3000 to be there, there had to be some people to help with the coordinating of the 3000 getting baptized. That's, that's a lot of people and that takes a lot of help. But then, you know, as you see, we increase you know, it's 5,000. And then when you get to Acts 6, 1, it says, now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the 12 summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, is it not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? Now, the point is not to see that there was a complaint arose, but there was an increase because of the increase of people coming to the Lord. There was an increase in needing to help manage all that needed to take place to help serve the people of the Lord. Then in Acts 7, it says, then the word of God spread and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And so what I was just reading and just thinking and meditating on is that as we pray, we have an expectancy for our prayers to be answered. When we at praying for healing, finances, just peace in the situation, we expect it to be answered because we know in Mark eleven twenty four 24, it says, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that ye shall believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. So we always have this expectation. Thank you of from our prayers. But even in that, the Lord said, let me take it a little bit further because we know we're hearing all of these messages about where now we are really being grown up in the things of the Lord our spiritual maturity, our growth. We keep talking about revival and wanting the Lord, you know, just his presence to become, but we have an expectation also that that is going to happen. So even as Tom was saying today, he was saying, you know, the Lord is saying, come, he's beckoning people to come. We're expecting God to answer his presence. We're expecting God to answer the multiplication, our desires and our needs. But on the flip side of that, as he's beckoning people and growing us up, there's going to be people to come. 
but are we prepared for the harvest that's coming? And so in that he has blessed us to be fruitful and to multiply. He has put things, gifts, skills, talents in us to be used for his service so that when they do come, we're prepared for the harvest. We're not just prepared for when we're praying, say for instance, if we're praying to expect, you know, for a baby, we start going to the store to get the things we need for the baby. You know, we're praying for a car, we prepare and get the insurance and, you know, just get our finances in order because we're expecting the blessing to come. But even as we know the Lord is growing us up in the maturity of him, he is, we are desiring, we are seeking him just from the messages that have been taught and just are being preached in this house. There there is a harvest that is coming and we as a church we need to be ready prepared for the expectation of that harvest and so just even in that let the river flow tom said he just said they're coming the lord is saying come unto me there are people who are outside these four walls who are hungry who are seeking the lord who just want the truth the real god not show but they just really want to know who he is as we answered the call, when he beckoned us we answered and as we go as we get filled and we go out we're going to draw people because they may say there's something different in your life. I want what you want. What is it that you have? And we're just telling them about the God that we know, the Jesus we serve. We are lights in dark places. As we avail ourselves to him, wherever we go, we don't know how he's going to use us. But even in that, he's going to say, they're going to come. They're going to say, well, where do you go? I go to Faith Harvest. Won't you just come and visit? Sure. And as they come, are we ready to, are we prepared for the harvest? Even as we are growing up this way, we have to be grown up this way too, because we have to receive them. So he's growing up this way. There are some who are coming, we don't even know, but are we prepared for the harvest? And it's just not saying that we're not preparing, but sometimes we don't think like, oh, we got to remember we're praying for all these things. I forgot when they come, we got to be ready to serve them when they get here. So just remember to tap into the gifts, the skills, talents, God that has placed in you just to be used for his service. I know in Genesis 1 28 in the Amplified version, it says, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. So even as God is our provider, he already knows what's needed. So sometimes when he sends you to a house for fellowship and worship, he's also placed things in you to be used in the house, not just outside in our workplaces or just, you know, volunteering in different places places, but he says, I've put gifts in you to display my glory in the earth, you know? And so, and it's just, we have to remember, be mindful. Yeah. It's not just about, you know, serving on work or in that places, but God placed in us, even before we even knew gifts and talents for us to be used at that right time. So it's just tap in to that and just be ready as we pray and expect our blessings when we have needs, healing and things of that nature, that as we are seeking God for him to just grow us up in him on the flip side is, yeah, there's going to be more coming. We are in the last days. There are going to be a lot more coming because they're seeking him. And we just need to be prepared and ready to receive them. And we can see that even as we look how things have changed within this building and sometimes we are outgrowing this building. Ha! But God has prepared a place for us. And we are faith harvest, so we are faithful for that harvest that is coming. We are standing on the expectation that, Lord, it will come just as you know it is needed for us, for this building and just everywhere in the church, because Jesus is coming back for his bride and he wants his bride to be prepared. So we also are going to be prepared. So, Father, just stretch your hands to what you're giving. Father God, we thank you. 
that you are God and you are such the great God, the all knowing God, that you are creator Elohim, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, that Father God, you know all that we need even before we make the request known, that Father God, you already have the provision. So, Father God, as we give into the kingdom, as we give out of obedience of our tithes, our offerings, Lord God, sowing seeds, Father God, we thank you because you give to us that we can give back. You supply seed for the sower and also bread. So Father God, we thank you because you are the God of multiplication. And so Father God, as we have given Lord God, we thank you that every need is met in the authority of the name of Jesus. Father God, we cancel the assignment of the enemy off of the harvest that is to come, Lord God. We know Know that we are sowing seed in good ground, Father God that you will send the rain in its season, Lord God. We thank you for the multiplication of it, Father, in the authority of the name of Jesus, that, Father God, we will be the good stewards that you have pla that you have caused and calling us to be, Father God, over that which you have blessed us with, Father God. And we thank you for even opening our eyes to see the gifts, talents, and treasures that are laying within us, which we may not be aware of which we may not be utilizing, but Father God, you will show us just exactly what to do with it. And Father God, we thank you for the harvest of souls that are coming. And Father God, we thank you in advance for the land, for Faith Harvest Church, for the building, Lord God, for everything, Lord God, that is needed for the servants, Lord God, in all the various ministries, Father God, we thank you. And we come with that spirit of expectation to know, Lord God, your word is true and it shall not return back void, but so shall your word be. So, Father God, we praise you and we thank you and we give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Glory to God. Good to see everybody this morning. Praise the Lord. It's always good to see you. Amen. Love to see your faces. Um, before we actually get into the word, let me just say this. Um, there should be, I think Betty told me there's a um, form on the back table there that has the slots that you can put your name in uh, for the body ministry month during the month of July. Um, we're trying to get three for each Sunday. Um, if need be, we can try to slip in a fourth one, but uh, we want to give people at least 15, 20 minutes to kind of say what they have in their heart to say. So if you want to just look at that, you know, we are talking about um, the five things the Lord put on our heart from the beginning of the year, walking in love, walking in honor and respect toward one another, working, uh, walking in, in prayer, a prayer life, but developing that life and then worship and then um, finding your place, really developing the gift and the callings on your life. So those are going to be the five subjects for each week. Um, so check that out and see what you want to be a part of. OK, we want to get that filled in as quickly as possible so we know how the services are going to be arranged. And then also there is a list back there for food items for um, the different Sundays because we're going to be setting up again like we have the last couple of years and have the tables already set. And we're going to also need some volunteers to get involved in helping that. Praise God. So, you know, just check that out and see what you can do. OK, don't forget that before you leave. You all have your Bible. Some of you say, I got my tablet, I got my phone, but you got the word. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to minister. We thank you for the Holy Ghost, our helper. We thank you that not only does he help us give utterance, but he gives us understanding. He quickens us through the word. And we thank you for that word today. 
We ask you, Lord, just to touch every single heart, mind, and soul in this place. And we give you all the glory now in advance for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the spirit of seeing and knowing, and I'm going to share a little bit about that, but we're going to, you know, tie in some other things. Um, uh, I remember, and I, I think we started off um, kind of in this direction, actually, with the message that we taught entitled Striving for the Mastery. But I remember, um, and, I, and I alluded to this, but I, I remember back when I pastored my first church in Mississippi, and I shared of, of the, the uh, experience that I had with that. But the one thing that I, I look back on that time in my life that I, that I really feel like was just a, a very important part in the development of ministry in me was when he really opened my eyes to understand humility. And, um, and I want you, if you would, if you would just turn your, in your Bible over to Philippians chapter 2. Uh, I thought it was very interesting, Tom, that uh, you brought out Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, 30. Um, because really what Jesus was teaching in that was something that he told us that really would be the foundation of us being able to do what he's called us to do. When he said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, basically he's saying there's a life that you can live that's an easy life. And there's a life that you can live that's light and it's not burdensome. Um, and, and of course, I think all of us want to live that, don't we? We want to get to the place where we see the ease in living the Christian life and we want to be in a place where we, we feel the lightness of this walk and not the heaviness of it. Amen. And so when he's talking about this, he, he says, come unto me, all you that labor. I'm going to have to get there and I'll give you rest. Isn't that what he said? And then he said this. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find what? Rest. You'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, Paul, you, I mean, uh, uh, Tom, you brought this out about lowly. And, and I think this is so important that we understand that this is Jesus telling us to take his yoke upon us and learn of him. And learn of him. So now go, if you would, to second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Well, actually, let's back up. Go back to Philippians chapter 2. And um, where I told you to go, <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to get there. I'm, my mind's filled with a bunch of stuff here. But anyway, it begins in verse one. Uh, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, I want you to catch that. If any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels of mercies and mercies fulfill ye my joy that you be like minded having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. See, here's that word lowly again. Lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now watch this, verse 5. Let this mind be in you. Isn't that what Jesus said? Learn of me, for I am what? Meek and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your soul. How many of us know this is where we have the bigger problem? Right here in this soul. And that's where the battleground is. And so he says here, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. Then he says, take my yoke upon you because my yoke is easy. And he says here in Paul's writing, let this mind be in you. What mind is he referring to? Well, you just have to go back up and read this first part of this uh, chapter. But the bigger part of what he's talking about here is communi communion with the body of Christ and communion with the Holy Spirit. 
And then he said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And then he gives us the formula to how to get into the mind of Christ. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, like I said earlier, um, when I was pastoring my first church and the Lord was really, really having to do some deep healing and some real deep work in me to come to the realization that it's not about me. It's, it's not even about my associations. It's about my personal walk with him. And, uh, you know, one of the books we wrote, one of the last chapters in that book is how to have a personal revival, because you're not going to ever have a corporate revival until everyone begins to work on having a personal revival. You got to have that desire on the inside of you to want what God wants. And then it grow into a, co a corporate setting where everybody's on the same page wanting what God wants. And then you'll see a breakthrough. But you got to have that corporate unity. And um, it starts here. This is where it starts. And that's what the Lord was showing me in Mississippi was there are four basic things that Paul describes here concerning Christ and what he did, which really is his mind, how he operated. And the very first one, it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And when the Lord began to open this passage up to me, what he what he began with was showing me here that Jesus was God. He came in the flesh as God, but he laid aside his his deity as God and took upon himself the form of a man. And in him making that decision to lay that down, it didn't lessen who he was. And, and, I, and I, when I saw this is what the Lord was showing me was um, there's a difference between understanding self-worth and understanding the righteousness of God. Because sometimes people think that when we're talking about laying our lives down, that we're laying down our self-worth. We're just putting self out of the way. We, we, we begin to start hating the flesh and we begin to start thinking less of ourselves because we have flesh that we have to deal with. And I don't know about you, but I've met Christians before that, you know, they they looked at self-denial and humility and giving up your will. It's almost like, you know, um, they 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 hated themselves. They they thought that that God wanted you to to hate yourself. You know, Jesus said, "If any man hate not, you know, he said, um, what is it? If if any man wants to be my disciple, he must hate, you know, his father, mother, brother, sister, and come unto me and follow me." And it, and and it's almost like we have this wrong concept of what he's describing as hate. He's not talking about despising something or lightly esteeming something he's he's basically saying that you've got to put something above what you think and what you want because when you when you if you go back to jesus's words in, in matthew 6 he said you can't serve god and mammon you'll love the one hate the other and and basically we're saying is you prefer one over the other you'll put one above the other and, and, and so it's not a matter of degrading ourselves. Humility is not, you know, getting so low in our thinking of ourselves that we just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of go into that ascetic mindset, you know, like we, we can't we can't, you know, like ourselves. We can't love ourselves. And that's a wrong concept. I said, that's a wrong concept. Paul even said, no man yet hateth his own flesh but loveth and cherisheth it, nourishes it. So, you know, it's not about, you know, diminishing who you are in yourself. It's esteeming who you are in him. And so Jesus never thought it robbery. He never looked at it like, you know, he had to grasp at who he was. He knew who he was, but he was willing to put that aside to serve whatever the purpose was for him to be on this earth. And then the second thing it says is that 
he he made himself of no reputation. And and basically that means that he, he wasn't out there trying to build who he was up. He wasn't trying to elevate who he was. In fact, many times when Jesus would minister to people, he'd just tell them, say, now don't tell anybody, you know, go your way, but don't tell anybody. And, and it was like the, the accolades that Jesus gained was because of his works, not because of his pride and his arrogance and him trying to make a show. You understand what I'm saying? And so the, the humility that Jesus walked in was that he understood the purpose of God, that he laid aside his deity. He became a man. He did not try to bring, you know, great influence about himself and who he was. And then it says, and he, he took upon the form of a servant. And we've talked about this, how that, that literally means he wore the apron. Jesus in John chapter 13, he put a towel around him, wrapped it around him. He washed the disciples' feet. He, he wiped their feet with the, with the towel. And it was a symbol of him being a servant that he came to serve. And he says, if, if I do this, then, you know, and I'm the master, then you, you're the disciple. You should follow in my steps. And, and, John, and, and Peter write, writes this, John writes this, that we're to follow in his steps, we're to walk even as he walked. We're supposed to pattern our lives after him. And then the, notice the last thing it says, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, here's, what, here's where I want you to go. Second, First Corinthians chapter 2, because this is part of us learning how to move with God. Uh, and, and I don't think there's anyone in here uh, that has any question in their mind that Jesus walked in the supernatural. I, I, you know, when you when we're talking about the manifestations of the spirit, we talked about the revelation gifts. We talked about the power gifts. We talked about the utterance gifts. If you look at the life of Jesus, I mean, it was obvious that he lived in these gifts. He operated in them on a regular basis. He understood the wisdom of God in, in the gift of the, of the word of wisdom. He understood the word of knowledge. He understood the discerning of spirits. He, he understood all of these. In fact, let me just take a moment, if you don't mind, and let me read something. Uh, I wrote this a while back, but I, I think this is very helpful for us to understand because, you know, a lot of people just don't understand what the gifts of the spirit are. They, they just, you know, they... They know that they exist, but they haven't gone after them enough to really understand how they work. And so I want to help you see something here this morning before we go any further. When Paul lists these nine manifestations, he, he gives us, like I said, three revelation, three power, three utterance gifts. And uh, let me give you a, an understanding of that. The word of wisdom is is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Ghost concerning God's future plans and purposes. So you, you, have, to, you have to think of it in that term. When, when God's giving you a word of wisdom, it always has to do with His plan or her, His purpose. And, and you can see that in the life of Jesus when He operated and He would say, you know, one time He came out of prayer and they all came to seek Him and Jesus said, we must go to the next town for this is why I've been sent. He had direction. He had insight into what His next step was. That's part of God giving us wisdom for the plan and the purpose that he has for our lives. We have to follow him and he gives us insight into what we're to do. Um, you have the incident of Ananias in Acts chapter, what is it, chapter, um, chapter 9, I think it is, when Paul came into, the, uh, came into uh, Damascus and he was there to, to persecute the church and how he had that experience on the road where a light came down and he fell to the earth and the Lord began to speak to him. And he said, and he said, I want you to go into the city and it'll be told thee what you shall do. So he got some direction. There was an incentive to go because now he had some insight for a purpose that was to come. And then on the other side, you have Ananias who he gets a word from God and says, I want you to go to one called a street called straight and inquire of one whose name is Paul, Saul. And uh, and he said, for he's been called for a purpose and and minister to him. And so he was getting direction. He was getting insight. That was a word of wisdom 
Now, in other words, it's showing you what you're supposed to do. Then notice it says that there's um, another part of this. It says it provides an answer, a directive or solution to a situation that may be pressing or pending that could not be known naturally. In other words, there, there's information that the Holy Ghost tells you, even like in Acts chapter 16, when Paul was trying to go into Asia and the Holy Spirit forbade him. And then he was going to go into Bithynia. And again, the Holy Spirit said no. And it was that night that he got a vision and he saw a man from Macedonia saying, come over and help us. He got direction. He got he got um, insight in where he was supposed to go. He wanted to go in Asia, but the Holy Spirit forbade him. It was a word of wisdom that took him into Macedonia. So, you know, these are things that God wants to do. He wants to give us this kind of gift. Then the word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Holy Ghost of certain facts in the mind of God, facts and details that would not be known in the natural. And a perfect example of this is Jesus when he was at the well and that woman was, you know, drawing water and Jesus began to talk to her and he began to tell her, you know, who he was, that he was life and, you know, that he had water to give her. And uh, and she said, well, you must be a prophet. And remember, Jesus said um, when she was was talking about uh, his, you know, certain things, you know, we know that this well was the well of Jacob and, you know, and all that. And Jesus said, go, go call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. He goes, no, I know because you've had five men. You've had five. And, and she recognized that he had insight into her life. There was something that he was describing that was already or had existed at the time that he was speaking to that. So when you're dealing with a word of knowledge, it's, it's like giving you insight, but it's not about the future. It's about the, the past or the present, something that has already occurred or is occurring at the moment. So it's like knowledge of a situation. And, you know, we've seen that happen many times in our ministry. And, and this is probably one of the most prevalent gifts that operate in, in my life is having insight into things that are going on. It's like I can feel things. I mean, we were talking about this the other night, Cornelius and I, how that you just kind of sense things. You just pick up things. You can walk into a room and you can feel whether there's strife in the air or whether there's, you know, contention in the air. You can you can tell when somebody walks in, they got heaviness on them. There's a there's an oppression on them. You, you, you just kind of have a sense of things. Some of this can flow over into a discerning of spirits, but but some of it is just God giving you insight of what's going on in the situation. And then there can be details that come with that where you have specifics that God wants you to know. And um, that's like what Jesus had with this woman. Discerning of spirits is a supernatural revealing from God of the presence and activity of the spirit world. This describes one's supernatural ability to perceive the true nature of a spiritual situation or to discern what spiritual forces are really at work in the life of an individual or in specific circumstances. It can involve an open vision into the unseen realm where you actually see into the unseen realm, but it can also mean detecting the activities of what's going on in that unseen realm. You can you can sometimes sense it um, and, 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 and you don't necessarily see. Sometimes you can see, but it, it's a spiritual thing. I remember the vision I had of Jesus that time when I was in prayer and he was standing about 12 feet away from me. I, I didn't see him with my natural eyes, but it was just as real as if I'd seen him with my natural eyes. Because there was details in the vision. And it was like I saw different things. Like I saw how he was standing with his arms folded. I, I saw, I noticed his mouth when, I, when he spoke to me, his mouth didn't move. But words were coming out of his person and they were speaking to me. Those are things that you wouldn't see in the natural. Uh, you know, I didn't see in the natural rather, but, but I saw it in the spirit. And, and so these are things that God is wanting to bring us into an understanding. Uh, I remember what Peter said when, he, when uh, Simon wanted to get the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he said, I perceive that you're in the gall of bitterness. And, and, and um, so, you know, he perceives something. 
You know, Paul, when he was on the uh, trip to Rome, he was in the ship and he says, I perceive that there's going to be uh, uh, something that's going to happen to the ship and we're going to lose the lading of the ship. He said, but the lives will not be, be, be lost. And then he, then he heard God speak to him. An angel appeared to him and said, Paul, you're, you know, everything's going to be okay. And he told him, he said, he even told him when he was come out of that, he said, look, everything's going to be all right. I have heard from heaven. There was one that stood by me and told me everything's going to be okay. So there are, there's discernment of things that God wants us to, to, to have in our spiritual walk. And most of this is, you know, to prevent something from happening that God doesn't want to happen in our life. The gift of faith is a, this is very interesting between the gift of faith and the work of miracles and how this operates is a supernatural impartation of God's faith to perform a miracle or to establish what God desires in protecting or delivering one from danger. And uh, we can we can see this in many different cases of the Bible. Uh, probably one of the most uh, notable ones is when Paul was on his road to 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 Rome and they stopped at the what was it? The Isle of uh, I can't remember the name of the, the Isle, but uh, he they were gathering sticks and, and the serpent came out and bit him. You remember that and how it says and Paul just shook it off. And the natives thought, you know, he's going to drop dead any moment because obviously they recognized that it was a venomous snake. snake. And nothing happened to Paul. Nothing happened. I mean, he didn't even pray about it. He just shook it off. That's the gift of faith. That's that faith that you just know this thing can't harm me. This thing can't do any harm to me. And you just move on and you just keep on going. And, and that, that, that's a gift. You can't just muster that up. Amen. Uh, and then when you're operating in this, there's no limit. There's just absolutely no limit. Your faith will just soar beyond your natural faith. The working of miracles is a supernatural demonstration of the energy and force of the Holy Ghost that reverses or suspends natural law. I mean, when you think about a miracle and you know that no natural cur cure brought this about, that this was something supernatural. Um, I, I was just reading um, a testimony, just amazing testimony of, of a young uh, woman that had, I think it was a woman, with John G. Lake's ministry, where she, I mean, her situation was so bad, so bad, that she had a growth that grew out the side of her leg and then she had something happen to the, her foot to where it, the bone started growing and it grew about six or eight inches longer than the other foot. And so she had, I mean, she was like this and she came into the prayer line to be prayed for. And John G. Lake was praying for her and, um, and God, I mean, to make a long story short, God did a miracle. I mean, the, the bone that was sticking out of her leg just all of a sudden just went back in. And within a week, her feet went back to normal. I mean, the bone that had grown out now had shrunk. That's a miracle. Amen. Amen. And, and, and you just think about some of the miracles that Jesus had in his ministry. I mean, even raising the dead. That goes beyond natural law. Isn't that right? Now, it, according to the Greek, listen to this, it's, it doesn't just call it working of miracles. The Greek actually says the operation of powers. This would suggest that it is an operation of God's power that overrides natural law and quickly does what, the nat what is naturally impossible. We have a lot of these in the gospel in the book of Acts. The working of miracles is active, whereas the gift of faith is more passive. You know, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, um, activity that goes on with the gift of faith as far as you. It's like you're in a calm, a perfect calm and things are happening. It's like Daniel in the lion's den. He, he, how do you sleep with fierce lions that want to eat you? And yet God shut their mouths and he slept like a baby. And that was the gift of faith in operation. 
and the working of miracles. Amen. Uh, Brother Hagin said something that I thought was very interesting when he was describing the difference between the working of miracles and the gift of faith. He said, the working of miracles could also be called the working of acts of power, which agrees with what the Greek described it as. According to the Greek concordance, the Greek word also means explosions of almightiness or impelling, staggering wonders or astonishments. In other words, the Greek could read this way to another Instead of the working of miracles and the gift of faith, it says to another, the working of impelling, staggering wonders or astonishments or the outworking of explosions of almightiness and acts of power. Now, you think we could use some of that today? Amen. Those are things that God wants to give us. And he says the manifestations are given to every man. Gifts of healings. This is a very important one. Supernatural healings of diseases or sicknesses without the aid of natural means for cure. The idea is suggesting. Now, here's what you need to understand about the gifts of healings and how they differ. The idea is suggesting a progressive work. Sometimes we see manifestations that happen immediately but in the sense of the gifts of healings, healing always lends itself to a progressive work an amending beyond the aid of man, a cure that is supernaturally progressive. And then, of course, we have the utterance gifts. We all understand these, the prophecy, tongues and interpretation of tongues. And you can go through the Gospels. I would encourage you to go through the Gospels or even the book of Acts and just make a note or underline or write it down on a, on a piece of paper the different times that you see these manifestations in operation. And it will actually amaze you how, how, um, how fluent they were and how much they flew, flowed in the church and especially in the ministry of Jesus. So, so um Go back over the message that we shared today and get all that information, write it down and, and do some studying on it, because I believe it will bless you. But now here's what what the Lord said to me in first Corinthians chapter two. I think I told you to go over there. If I didn't go ahead. First Corinthians chapter two. When Paul's writing this, he starts off and I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto the testimony of God. Notice verse two. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, this is what Paul's saying. All I wanted to know among you is a revelation of the cross. Because there's something about the cross that satisfies everything that we have need of. Because it's what... Philippians 2 is actually talking about when Jesus humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was the finished work that he came to do in humbling himself. And I, I think it's very important that we understand that the cross is what he told us that we're supposed to bear. He said, you're to take it up daily. In other words, if you want to live in the supernatural, you got to get you out of the way. Because that's where the activities of the spirit begin to operate is when you get into a place where you put yourself aside, not not diminish yourself. It's never about diminishing yourself. It's about realizing the scope of what God wants to do that you don't want to be in the way of what God wants to do. You want to step out of the way and say, Lord, this is not this is not me. I'm not going to look to me to do this. I'm going to look to you. And that's really what you were talking about, Tom. And that lowly life is is recognizing that this is God doing this, not me. And and so he goes on and he says this. I love the way Paul writes this. He said, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He's talking about that natural man. And he said this. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power 
So, so he's, he's describing the demonstration of the Spirit and power in contrast to man's wisdom. And if you read on down, he begins to start talking about a hidden wisdom, a mystery that was, in a, that was given in a mystery. And, and the, the wisdom that he's describing, if you read on down, the wisdom that he's describing is the working of the Holy Ghost. Because he said in verse, what is it, 13, he said, which things we speak not in the words which man's wisdom speaketh or teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. There's a wisdom that comes out of the working of the Holy Ghost. And that's what Jesus walked in. He knew, he knew how to minister to every situation he was faced with because not only was he cooperating with the Holy Ghost and letting the Holy Ghost lead and guide him, but he was getting wisdom about how to do it. He was getting wisdom. I mean, you know, when you stop and, 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 and you've got a situation where you're praying for a man to be healed and suddenly you reach down, you spit in some clay, you make this mass of clay with spit and then you put it on a man's eyes. Where do you find that as an example to follow after? You know, this was an original work of the Holy Ghost. But it was the wisdom of God for Jesus to step into the way God wanted to do it. Why he chose that? We'll just have to wait to get to heaven to find out. But the fact is, it got results. It brought results. It made, this man was whole. So, you know, this is where the wisdom and the working of the Spirit flow together. Because when you get over into the end of this chapter, it says... Look, it says in verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And this is, this is what God's trying to get us to understand. The mind of Christ is what you're going to have to have to cooperate with the Holy Ghost and move with the Holy Ghost when he wants to move. You, you can't just, you know, do this out of the, you know, your own imagination. Well, so and so, so and so laid hands on them and they did this and they did that. So I'm just going to follow that. It's not it's not that's not going to necessarily work. Amen. I, there's denominations that have been built on a manifestation of the spirit. And, and yet God never told us to do it exactly the same way. Every time, always the same. You've got to learn how to flow with the Holy Ghost. He may just tell you to do something that's totally different than anybody's ever done. Your natural mind's going to argue with you. But if you know the Holy Ghost and you're walking in the counsel of the Holy Ghost, that wisdom, He's going to give you understanding and He's going to show you. Eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Can you say amen? So, so these are things that the, that the Lord's trying to get us as the church to, to grasp. And it's all, listen, it's all born. It's all born out of us understanding that it's never about us. It's never about us. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, if God all of a sudden just blessed you and anointed you and you had the word of wisdom flowing in you and, and you were getting words for everybody and you had the word of knowledge operating in you and, or you had the working of miracles, the gifts of healings, you know what? It, it would be very easy to get lifted up in pride. I, I remember Brother Higgin, uh, I have a, a teaching by him that is just an absolutely extraordinary message. But it, it's talking about how he learned many of the things that he learned in ministry by the things he suffered. Right. And, and, you know, that, that just, you know, goes so against what we thought was the faith message. You know, we're supposed to be positive people. You know, what about suffering? Well, we're not supposed to talk about suffering. And yet he taught about it. And what he shared was how that in his early years of ministry, you know, there were times when God took him into places that was hard. I mean, churches that were just bound up. And he, he gives an example uh, in one of his stories of how that he was pastoring this church. And he said the, 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 the situation was so bad 
that he said he told his wife, if I didn't know that God called me to this church, to pastor this church, he said, I'd pack up all my belongings in the middle of the night. I'd pull a U-Haul up right here in the front of the parsonage. I'd pack it up all in the middle of the night. I'd leave before daybreak. And he said, when people came to their parsonage to see their pastor, he said they'd find the house empty and nobody living there. And he wouldn't tell a soul he was leaving town. I mean, he felt that that disconnected from from the church. And he said he had to go through some suffering because God wouldn't release him from that church. And 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 he he shares one time where he said he was ministering. And I can't remember the, the account, but it was like three, maybe four people that were in wheelchairs that just jumped out of the wheelchair and started running. Just totally healed. I mean, working of miracles right there before his eyes. And this is what he said that was really the basis of that message. And it really resonated on the inside of me. He said, if I hadn't gone through some of the things I went through, and the hardships that I had to endure. He said, when that happened, he said, my head would have been so big, I wouldn't have been able to get out the back door. He said, but because God had tempered me through trials, he said, I knew it was not about me. Amen. And he said, and God was able to use me because I got me right in that situation. And, you know, I think that was part of my my boot camp was Mississippi because that's when I realized that, that it, it was all him and it couldn't be me. And of course, you know, <laughs> I'm still learning that lesson. <laughs> Amen. But now I want you to think about this because when we're talking about this wisdom, this is so important that you understand. There are two Greek words for the word wisdom. Uh, one is Sophia. And the other is phronesis. And the word Sophia, and this is, this is why it's so important that you understand this, because if, if you can connect wisdom to learning how to flow with the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, your life will, be, will begin to take shape and in, in, in form concerning the path that God has for you. Because see, we're, we're, we're all, it all goes back to this, the the witness and the unction, the witness and the unction. And if you learn the, the witness and the unction, how they cooperate and work with each other, it'll cause you to step into the wisdom of God. And there are, there's, there's basically four different kinds of wisdom in the New Testament that we, we've, we can read about. One, of course, is the wisdom of the world, which we know we don't want anything to do with that because it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. Amen. But there is a godly wisdom that that we have in the scripture there is the spirit of wisdom that paul said he prayed over the church of ephesus to receive and then like we've talked about the word of wisdom so so the, it, for the church there's three aspects of this wisdom that god wants us to walk in he wants us to have godly wisdom and that's where these two greek words sophia and phronesis apply to our lives because and listen to this sophia if you define that, it's having true insight into the nature of something. So when you when you all of a sudden you you're hit with something that's from the blind side and you don't know why it's there. You don't understand what it is that you're dealing with. God wants to give you that insight to you can see what's going on. What is this about? Why is this coming? You Remember what James said? If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. In other words, there, there's an understanding that God wants to give us so that we can see why, what in the world is this temptation, this trial, this test? Why all of a sudden I step out of the house and I'm in a war? What is going on? And God said, you can ask for that counsel and the Holy Ghost will give you understanding of the nature of that thing. What it is. It may be trying to stop you from a ministry that's going to come forth that the devil's trying to sidetrack and, and hinder so that that ministry is never accomplished. And you've got to be able to look through that and say, well, you know, I'm not going to let that stop me. I'm going to continue on and let God show me what he wants me to do. 
Then this other word, phronesis, which is a very interesting Greek word. It, it actually has to do with practical wisdom. And, and you know, um, you know, we're so sometimes in the body of Christ, if, if we, I, I think you understand this phrase, but sometimes we become so spiritually minded, we're no earthly good. You know, we got our head way up in the clouds and we're just not even looking at things in the natural the way God wants us to look at it. And, and we override things. We, we just think, well, you know, it doesn't matter. I believe in God. And, and, and the Holy Spirit saying, well, there, there's a practical side to this. Amen. Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, how many of y'all know who Smith Wigglesworth was? I mean, it, it, here's a man that got started late in life in ministry. And in his ministry, he raised 23 people from the dead. And, and this man walked in the power of God. I mean, he had it operating all the time in his life. And, and, and there's a story told of him one time when he went out to take a walk. And he went over this this uh, this bridge it was, a, you know, you could walk over and the wind caught up, caught up and blew his hat off his head. And it was he was lost his hat. And he turned to the person he was walking with. And he says, we, we have to go back to the house. They said, well, why? And he said, because um, I, I don't have a covering on my head and I'm not going to allow the enemy to give me a cold. I mean, the, the man, that's practical wisdom. You didn't need a revelation for that. You just know if it's cold outside, you put, you know, put a coat on. You know what I'm saying? There are certain practical things that God wants us to walk in. But, but this word, phronesis, not, not only talks about the practical side of wisdom, but it, this is the Greek word, phronesis. It means to have a holy love for the will of God. In other words, when you're walking in this kind of wisdom, it's all about the will of God. It's all about the will of God. You're, you're not going to turn to the right or to the left. You're going to keep your eyes on Jesus. And you're going to follow the path that God has for you. Even if that path may seem hard, you're going to take that path. And I, and I use this as an example because this is such a powerful example in Acts chapter 20 and 21. When Paul was speaking to the elders there uh, in Miletus, he told them, he said, you know, I've not, decla I've not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And he said, and, and, and I've told you that every city I go, every city I go, the Holy Ghost witnesseth. Remember, we're talking about witness and unction. The Holy Ghost witnesseth. That bonds and afflictions abide me. He said, but I don't count my life dear unto myself. He said that I might finish my course with joy. He, want, he knew that he had a path that he was supposed to walk. If you go back to Acts chapter 9, one of the words that Ananias told him was, you're going to suffer things for my sake. That was part of the call on, life, on Paul's life. He knew he was going to go through some hardships. You go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and read all the lists that Paul went through, most of us would never have survived it. But he knew this was part of his calling. And so, you know, he goes over into chapter 21, and his, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he wants to, you know, be a partaker of the feast. And he has a time frame he has to get there. And so he's making his way there and he stops in Troas. And all of a sudden, certain disciples there in Troas begin to prophesy to Paul and tell him, you know, not to go up to Jerusalem because there's just a concern. There's a check we have about you going to Jerusalem. We, we don't want you going to Jerusalem. It's not going to be good. And, you know, Paul just never said much about it. He went on over to um, to Philip's house you know, and then all of a sudden the prophet Agabus comes down and he prophesies over Paul. Now, this isn't just certain disciples getting a check. This is a prophet, a man of God that's a, called to be a prophet that has the word of the Lord in his mouth. And he tells Paul, he said, he binds himself with his own girdle. He says, the man that hath this girl, he said, he's going to be bound hand and foot. And all of them began to just encourage Paul, you better not go, you better not go, you better not go. And Paul answers them this with this. He says, why do you weep and try to break my heart? I'm willing not only to suffer for the name of the Lord, but to die. And so they answered and said, well, 
Let the will of the Lord be done. Let the will of the Lord be done. And, and, and see what happens in this is this is why it's so important that we have the wisdom of God. Because Paul had already had the Holy Ghost tell him that he would witness to him in every city that bonds and afflictions were waiting him. So when he gets over here in Caesarea at Philip's house and a, and a prophet tells him, you're going to have you're going to be bound. They looked at it as a warning. They looked at it as don't go. We don't want you to go into that city and be bound. Paul looked at it and said, I got my witness. This is what's awaiting me. I don't care if I have to suffer. I'll even die for the Lord if need be. But this is the Holy Ghost witnessing to me in every city that bonds and afflictions are waiting for me. So he was prepared for what was coming. It didn't catch him off guard. And then if you follow the whole story in Acts chapter, you know, what is it? Chapter 22 all the way through, uh, you know, Paul had to get to Rome. And the Lord even spoke to him one time and he said, I have called you for this purpose, that you are to go before Caesar. So there was a purpose in that. That was a witness that the Holy Ghost was giving him, but he had the direction of the Lord to go. And I believe he went with the unction. He knew this was God and he was prepared for whatever came. So this is where we have to understand that the wisdom of God is not only see the nature of what's going on, but also to have such a holy love for the will of God that it won't take me off course if I go through some hardships. Because, you, you know, you don't know what's coming. You know, you, do, you just don't know. But you know that if you're in the will of God, then it doesn't matter what you go through. Praise God. You just do what the Lord tells you to do and just trust him that he's going to carry you through it. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Now, we said that we have to follow in the path that Jesus has given us. And the path, of course, is that we, 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 we learn of him, that he's meek and lowly. We take upon ourselves his yoke, his burden. And then we walk even as he walked. We follow the path that he had, which is to keep ourselves in the wisdom of God so that the Holy Ghost can cooperate with us in giving us the counsel of what to do, how to do it. Praise God. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure every one of us could tell a testimony or two of how the Holy Ghost stopped us. We, we were planning on doing something and the Holy Ghost stopped us. Said, nope, nope, don't do that. I, I've, I, I can remember, <laughs> this, is, this is a little different and off the cuff, but uh, I remember one time I was pastoring in a church and, and uh, one of the ladies that was on our board, uh, she, I don't know what was causing her to do this, but she just started um, acting kind of strange. And um, I, I knew that the, the, the activity that was going on in her life wasn't right. And there was some competition that was going on. And there was some things that were that were going on that was grieving the Holy Ghost. And I was praying about it. And uh, we went to a meeting. And there was some activity that went on in that meeting with where she was involved. And uh, it, she didn't embarrass me, but. She disrespected me in front of people. And um, and I went home grieved. I went home grieved. And I, and I, boy, I'm telling you what, when 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 you're in that state of mind, your mind is like having machine gun bullets going through it. How you want to hurt her, how you want to harm her, how you want to just, you know, just do whatever you can think of, you know. And I'm and I, I got in my recliner. Betty will tell you this. I got in my recliner and I said, Lord, I got to get this off of me. I got to I got to get these out of my mind because I mean, they're just rushing through me. And 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 the Holy Ghost said, you just pray, just pray. And I sat in my chair for two hours praying in tongues, just praying in tongues. And suddenly after two hours, it all just left me. All of that left me and I felt the love of God. I felt like I could walk up to her in good, a good attitude and hug her, love on her without having any offense. 
sometimes you have to just go into that extent to get off of whatever it is the enemy tried to throw on you. And um, but I knew there was something wrong that needed to be corrected. Now, you know, I know pastors and I'm a different kind of a pastor. Just just let me just tell you, I'm a different kind of pastor. But but I know pastors that would have taken that like a bull by the horn and would have gone in there and and wrangled that situation until it was resolved. But I, I learned a long time ago, the best way to deal with things is let the Holy Ghost deal with it. Yes. And there are times that I've had issues in the church that I knew I had to pray it through. I couldn't go talk to somebody and tell them what it was that I was dealing with. I had to pray it through. And so that was one of those cases I had to pray it through. When I, when I prayed it through, it wasn't that the situation in her was resolved. It was the situation in me that was resolved. But there was still a situation that needed to be resolved. And so I said, Lord, what are we going to do? And, uh, and he just basically said, just, just turn it over to me. Just turn it over to me. And so we did. We just said, Lord, you, you, you deal with that situation. We're not going to touch it, but you know we've got to get it resolved. And about a week later, I'm telling you the honest truth, about a week later, she has to have a little meeting with Pastor Betty and I. So we met at the church, sitting down, just the three of us. And she looks at me and she said, Pastor David, I don't want to upset you. But the Lord's told me I'm supposed to step down off the board. And I'm not supposed to be on the board anymore. Now, you know, everything on the inside of me was like a little kid in a candy store. I was jumping up and down saying, yes, yes, yes. I looked at her. And God is my, God is, I'm telling you the honest truth. God, God will get me if I'm not telling you the truth, okay? <laughs> I looked at her and I smiled and I said, are you sure you want to do that? Because <laughs> I don't want you to get out of the will of God if you're supposed to be on the board. And she goes, no, I think I'm supposed to step down. So we accepted her resignation. <laughs> and God handled that so beautifully. There was no strife. There was no problem that it, God just took care of it. He did what he said he was going to do. He just took care of it. That's wisdom. OK, that's the counsel of the Holy Ghost and learning how to flow with him. And, and there's situations in life we have where, you know, somebody may hurt our feelings. And, and sometimes we just, you know, we want to gnash on them. But, you know, you got to learn how to walk in the counsel of the Holy Ghost, because sometimes the Holy Ghost will just say, well, you know, you're going through a hardship right now with this. Your emotions are all bent out of shape. And it's just to let you know you need some work done on the inside of you. You, you know, you got to learn how to let it go off of you like water off a duck's back and give it to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I don't know why I'm saying all that because that's not in my notes, but it's the truth anyway. Amen. Now, let me let me say this real quick and we'll find it in. How many of y'all remember the five things I shared with you that have to do with Paul's revelation? Anybody remember the five things that Paul? I, I, I'm not going to embarrass any of y'all. Um, I, I didn't see a lot of hands, but but they, these are things that we have to build into us. I mean, I'm talking about if you if you want to walk in the revelation of what the Holy Ghost wants us to walk in and to begin to connect with this kind of counsel that Paul was describing as the hidden wisdom and having the teachings of the Holy Ghost teach you so that you now have the mind of Christ and operating in everything that the Holy Ghost wants you to operate in, especially when it comes to seeing and knowing. you got to know these five things. they got to get built into you. How many of y'all know what John 3.16 says? Is there anybody in here that thinks they could quote that? If I asked for a raise of hands, do you think anybody in here could raise? See, there's a couple of hands that you you got that. You got that down. You got that down. Amen. Well, you need to get these down just like you know that. And if you go into Paul's revelation, remember what Jesus said? Upon this rock, I will build my church. The revelation of who? Christ. Paul had that revelation of who Christ was. And he even says in Galatians chapter 1, I didn't receive this of man or taught it by man, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. 
And this is what he taught. Number one, he taught what happened to Jesus from the time he died on the cross till he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He, he, he went through the extensive acts of what happened to Jesus when he died and how he went into the heart of the earth. He went to the lower parts of the earth. And he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Amen. And then he ascended and he went and sat down at the right hand of the Father. That, that whole operation of what happened from the cross to the throne is, the, is really the basis of Paul's revelation. But the second thing that he taught in that, which was our identification with that, because he didn't just die for himself, he died for us. He took our place. He became sin for us. Amen. So there's an identity in what he went through. He was carrying our sicknesses, our pains. He was carrying our sins. He was carrying it. It was us. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Literally, it, 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 it's in the present tense, but in the Greek, it's literally, I was, because it was, he's looking back at the cross. I was crucified with Christ. Lombok says it this way, Christ took me to the cross and I died there with him. I died when he died. I was made alive when he was made alive. When he rose from the dead, the Bible says that he quickened us. And he made us to go up with him and sit with him at the right hand of God. Amen. So there's an identity. Why? Because whatever he did for us has now been accomplished in us. And that's the third thing that Paul taught was what God was doing in Christ for us. And then the fourth point is what the Holy Ghost is doing in us as a result of that work. See, it's one thing to have the, the legal uh, knowledge of what happened on the cross and what Jesus did in his death, burial, and resurrection. But now let's make it applicable to our lives. Let, let's begin to become a partaker of that divine work and walk it out. And then lastly, and this is a very important part, very important part. If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll get a better understanding of this. But it's the present day ministry of Jesus, what he did. See, he he entered into a new phase of ministry. He came on this earth and he operated as a man and he carried out a work. And the cross, he says, it's finished. Whatever he had to do here on the earth, he finished it. And then when he went and sat down at the right hand of the father, he said, I'm going to pray the, the father that he'll give you another comforter, one just like me. That he's going to be with you and he's going to abide with you forever. And so what did he do? He went and took his place at the right hand. And now he's the general advocate over the church. God said he gave him to be head over all things to the church. So he's now the head over the church. But he orchestrated how this work on the earth was to be done through another comforter, a helper. A paraclete that would work with us on a daily basis to be able to carry out his assignment. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. He's our, um, you know, counselor, our helper. Amen. He's everything to us. And how he operates is now he, he funnels everything down through the Holy Ghost. What heaven gets, he gives to the Holy Ghost. What the Holy Ghost gets, he gives to us. He shall take of mine and show it unto you. What does he say he has? All that the Father hath is mine. And I say again, he shall take of mine and show it unto you. So this is where we have to get this revelation down on the inside of us. Number one, what happened from the cross to the throne. Number two, our identification with what he did, what God was actually doing in Christ for us, what the Holy Spirit is to do in us now as a result of the new birth, and then what Jesus is doing at the right hand of the Father. That's the basis of Paul's revelation. You've got to build that into you. Because when you understand everything that's in that, you're going to know something about who you are and what you have in you to carry out your assignment on this earth. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, uh, let me finish with this one thought. We're going into this month of July, and we're going to be talking about these five areas. 
And, and, and this is why I believe the Holy Spirit has put this on us as a mandate for this year, because I'm going to tell you, th there's, there's no better way. There's no better way to get where God wants us to get than to follow after these five things that he told us to that we're supposed to be practicing and, and working on. And I mean, I'm talking about working on it. Praise God. Now, we need to work on it. Amen. Um, how many of y'all have ever been challenged to walk in love? However, how many of y'all ever been challenged to, you know, step down and honor somebody that's in leadership above you? Well, I'm just not going to obey anything you tell me. Where did that come from? You know, what's the scripture say? In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord for all things, for this is the will of God. And then he says, And submit one to another in the fear of God. Do you know what that word means? Submit. Hupotasso. Remember what we said about it? Wearing the apron. Wearing the apron. When it comes to your relationship with me and my relationship with you, we're supposed to be wearing the apron. Hallelujah. What's that mean? If you need me to do something, I'm your servant. Come on now. This is what the Bible teaches. I'm just telling you what the Bible teaches. But now listen to this in closing. Philippians chapter 1, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified because this is so important. We're talking about walking in love, honoring one another, building a life of prayer, building a life of worship, which we'll get into some of this more. And then understanding the equipment that God's given us, the call, the tools, the equipment that he's given us to carry out our purpose and destiny. But listen to what he says here. This is out of the Amplified. Verse 9. And this I pray. So this is a prayer that your love may abound yet more and more and extend to its fullest development in knowledge and in all keen insight. There's that word insight has to do with Sophia. That your love may display itself in greater depth of acquaintance. And watch this. And more comprehensive discernment. Your love is where you're going to get discernment. So that you may surely learn. Listen to this. I love this. So that you may surely learn to sense what is vital. And approve and prize. And approve and prize. There's, there's a combination. Approve means you realize this is important. This is vital. And then you prize it. It means you make value in it. What is excellent and of real value, recognizing the highest and the best and distinguishing the moral differences. See, there's some things that the scripture says that are allowable, but they're not profitable. You've got to be able to distinguish the two. That's where this wisdom comes in. And that you may be untainted and pure and unerring and blameless. Wow. I'm, I'm praying. I'm praying that your love may reach its full extent because if your love reaches the full extent, you're going to have both Sophia love uh, wisdom and you're going to have phronesis wisdom. You're going to have insight and you're going to have a love, a holy love for the will of God. That's what love will give you. And it'll all be to this end, that you'll be untainted, pure, unerring, blameless, so that with hearts sincere and certain and unsullied, you may approach the day of Christ, not stumbling or causing others to stumble. Now look at verse 11. May you abound in and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, of right standing with God and right doing, which come through Jesus Christ, the anointed one, to the honor and praise of God. Listen to this. That his glory may be both manifested and recognized. God wants his glory to be manifested. 
And he wants people to be able to recognize it. And I'm telling you, when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, he said this was for the glory of God. So the glory of God is not just his presence that we enjoy. His glory is part of the works of God. When he manifests, it brings God glory. When he is recognized, it brings him glory. And sometimes it just takes us walking in the Spirit and doing what the Holy Ghost says. And suddenly, God gets the glory out of what comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't you want that for your life? Praise the Lord. Now, while I was praying this morning, early in the morning here, I, I kept getting some things in the spirit and I was really trying to fine tune what the Lord was saying. And one of the things that I, I felt the Lord wanted, the person's not here today. And, you know, it's 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 amazing to me how the enemy works sometimes to try to keep people from getting what they need. And I've watched this through the years. God will give me a word for somebody and they won't even show up. And you think, why in the world would they miss it? Then you think, well, why would you even give it to me? And it's because there was an interceptor. You know, you have the game of football. You throw a pass to the wide receiver. And what happens? A safety comes and jumps in front of him and steals the ball. That wasn't the intent, was it? But it happens. And there are things in the spirit that God's wanting to do that he sets in motion to do. And then suddenly it's. It's interrupted. And so, you know, the Lord guides us and leads us to say something when that person is here, then, you know, we'll, we'll obey the Lord. But, you know, I've learned a long time ago, you got to be in your place. you got to be where God tells you to be and not try to do this on your own. Because if, if you miss it, then you miss it. Amen. But I did have something in the spirit this morning that I felt strong about. And I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't quite sure how I was supposed to minister this out. But um, I felt three. Actually, it was four people, five people, actually five people. But we're going to leave the one that's not here out. But um, I, had a, I had a sense of, of something the Lord was saying in me this morning concerning you, Tony. I had something that the Lord was speaking to me, uh, a sense of it toward uh, Michael and toward Cornelius and something the Lord was speaking to me even concerning Lehman. But um, I'll just go as the, by the Holy Ghost and the flow of the Holy Ghost here and what he wants done. But um, you can just bow your head if you want. Just just get in the spirit with me on this. But Michael, I, I sense there was... Um, there was some toiling. There was some toiling that you were experiencing. And um, I, I don't really even know what that means. But I, but I knew that there was a deep cry on the inside of you for a greater sense of discernment. And, and the Holy Spirit says, if he'll just go with me, flow with me, I'll give him a greater degree of discernment. Greater than he's ever walked in before. And, and they'll, there will be a spirit of seeing and knowing operating in him. So, so don't what, whatever, whatever is um, giving you some trouble right now, whatever is going on in the inside, any kind of turmoil, anything that has been trying to interrupt your patterns, the things that you know that you're to do, um, just know that the Holy Spirit is already ahead of all of that. And he has some things he wants to do. And bringing you to a greater level of discernment. Hallelujah. And then Cornelius, I, when I saw you in the spirit this morning, immediately I, I saw the mantle of Elijah fall to the ground and Elisha pick it up. And, and the Lord said this to me. He said, if Elijah hadn't picked it up, that mantle would have fallen to the ground and no one would have been able to receive it. He had to grab it. He had to get it. He had to go after it. And 
And I, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I've talked to you on a number of occasions, but I don't really know the history of your family. Um, any pioneers in the past that have lived for God and walked with God? Uh, I, I just don't know. And, and it could be that it's some other aspect. It could be ministries that you've been associated with. But I, I sense that there was a mantle and that, that God was saying, uh, uh, he's got to go after that mantle. He's got to go after that mantle. And I believe that there's something awaiting you that somebody else, either in your family or ministry that you've been associated with, that your heart has cried to have something very similar to what they had. That the Lord's saying, you can have it because they've gone. They're, they're, they're not in your life anymore right now. But the mantle has fallen from them because they can't take that mantle with them to heaven. It, it's only here for the earth. But somebody's got to pick it up. Hallelujah. And if you'll just make a decision, I'm going to get that. I'm going after that. The Lord will answer that cry of your heart. And Tony, I, I, I just sensed something in my spirit this morning when I was praying for you. It was like I could, it was almost like the heart of God was letting me hear your heart. And there was a cry on the inside of you. Lord, I, I want to hear your voice better. I, I want to be able to have that discernment to hear your voice, to know how to move and what I'm supposed to do and, and, and get an intimacy of that following you to where I can catch you even in the minor details. Uh, there's a desire. I don't know how deep that desire is, but I sense it in my heart that the Holy Spirit was telling me that he, he wants to give you an understanding of his voice and his ability to communicate to you. And, and, and there's going to be, if you'll, if you'll decide in your heart, this is what I want. And this is what I'm going to go after. The Lord will get you so tuned in that you'll, you'll catch things that some other people won't catch. You'll hear things that other people won't hear. And it'll be a tremendous blessing to you, to your family, but it'll also be a tremendous blessing to the people in your life that you associate with. I, I, I can see it right now. I can see you at, at, at the job working, and your mind is completely on the task at hand. And suddenly the Holy Ghost will whisper in your ear, and He'll tell you to do something, or He'll tell you to say something. Or he'll give you an understanding of something. And, and you'll get familiar with that. You'll get so familiar with it that you won't miss it when he does speak. You know, we've got to come to that place in our Christian walk that we, we catch even the very whisperings of heaven. When heaven is speaking, even in that still, small voice, we catch it. We catch it. And, and I believe that's been a cry of your heart to catch it. And the Lord wants to give you that. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can stand to your feet if you'd like. Praise the Lord. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the, the desires that you have for your people. And, and let me just say this before I finish praying. When God gives a word, that is an eternal word that's from heaven. And it's specifically being directed toward an individual. But the Bible says that Anything that God speaks, if we can use our faith to grab a hold of it, it can become ours. Hallelujah. So if, if any of you in here have a desire for greater discernment, any of you have a desire to pick up a mantle and walk in what God's called you to walk in, it could be healing. It could be, you know, counsel. It could be some area of, of, of the gifts of the Spirit. It could be teaching. It could be any area that there's a mantle that's needed Go after it. Go after it. Praise God. And then if you're just wanting to fine tune your ability to hear from heaven, take a hold of that. Praise God. Amen. The Bible says that the very beginning of your Christian life, he said that it is the spirit that beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And so the witness begins the moment you get saved. You get that witness on the inside. It's living in you. Develop it. Develop it. Get to the place where you're real quick at catching what the Holy Ghost is saying. Hallelujah. And then learn to walk in the unction. 
Let the Holy Ghost guide you. And when he's put his hands on something to do, you just do it. Don't be afraid of their faces. Amen. Because God will hasten his word to perform it if you'll step out in it. Amen. Amen. So, that, Father, we do. We thank you for every single one in here that can receive what you've spoken. They, they grab a hold of it with their faith and say, I want that. I believe that can be mine in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for each one. Bless them, Father God, as we go further into this summer, as we approach this month of ministry. Lord, I pray that you guide them and lead them and, and just put it in their heart what they're to share on and, and let it be a, a tremendous blessing to them, but also to us, the church. We thank you for it. We give you praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. All right. God bless you. Don't forget the forms back there. Look them over. Find out where you're supposed to be. If you don't know, then just go home, pray about it, and come back next week. Fill it in. We've got a couple weeks before July. 